Welcome back to the My Latin Life podcast. Since 2014, My Latin Life has been your trusted guide to traveling and living in Latin America. Today, my guest is Alex Rocoso, founder of Baseflow, an innovative startup that is bringing freedom as a service to you. They are automating parts of the high-touch world of residency and internationalization, and it'll be very interesting to talk to them about the direction things are headed in the future. So Alex, welcome. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, absolutely. Where are you calling in from? So right now uh, I'm in Spain. Uh, That's where I'm from, even though now, you know, I'm based uh, in Lisbon. Mm -hmm. I'm calling in from Mexico City, but I was just over in Lisbon for a couple months. I absolutely love it. And in this episode, we'll talk a little bit about uh, Portugal and the benefits that that has for um, for everyone, but Europeans especially. Um, but yeah, maybe you could kick us off, Alex, by telling us a little bit about your background and how you got into this world. Yeah, sure. Um, so to be honest, I've been interested in the flag theory since a really young age. Um, I think I discovered it when I was like uh, probably 14 years old or so. Um, I was late, late in day trading, don't ask me why. Uh, but flag theory was like really popular among uh, like these groups of, of day traders and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, th- that really clicked on me. Um, and I got really interested into all this stuff, uh, you know, about planting your flags uh, in different countries, like having your residence in one place, also having a second passport to protect you from, from states uh, and governments and also having, you know, assets offshore and stuff like that. So, um like I said, I got into that at a really young age. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of um, stopped there. Like, it didn't uh, go farther. Um, but also at the same time, uh, you know, when I was 16, 17, um, I really started, you know, to get into building businesses. I built my first company, it was an e commerce uh, when I was 16, 17. Uh, and then my first startup when I was 18. Um, in college, it was like a mobile app to finding partners. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, like I really got interested into you know startups, technology, and stuff like that. And so when the pandemic hit, I got into the crypto rabbit hole. Um, and also at the same time, uh, you know, I started following uh, Valadis Rinivasan, the, the former CTO at Coinbase, uh, who who was talking a lot about you know not only crypto, um, but also network states and how this this mm-hmm. uh, you know, crypto NFTs and tokens, they were bringing together uh, communities that eventually, you know, they could lead to to countries themselves and, and, and nations. Um, and, you know, it was at that time when I really started thinking about that, um, thinking also about, you know, digital nomadism, how um, these people that were traveling around the world, uh, how they could set up the, their residency in the, the most uh, optimal way and their passports and and, and whatnot. Um, and, you know, since, since uh, I had discovered the flag theory at a really young age, that really resonated mm-hmm. with me. Um, so in the summer of 2020, I started working on, on like a project to try to automate all the legal and tax stuff for digital nomads, trying to, mm-hmm. you know, build like, like this sort of one-stop platform where, where you could just say, hey, I've been in these countries, this is my my uh, residency, or I want to move it to, to this other place. Uh, and, you know, that's how I found out that, that it was super complex, because, you know, in the end, it's an algorithm, it's a set of rules, uh, each country has its set of rules, but it's so complex to try to tackle it all at once and, and build, you know, all this comprehensive one-stop platform from, from scratch all at once. Um, and, you know, I kind of... Uh, left the idea there um but then uh you know uh when i saw that spain was releasing this new digital nomad visa i was like hey maybe you know it would be great to to start just with with one solution with with one place start help helping people move to spain um and that's how i got the idea for base flow and then you know slowly integrating more and more countries uh eventually i i didn't uh, end up starting with spain because they announced the visa, but then they delayed a lot uh, in in the in their approval and and really you know giving more real information about it. 
Uh, and so I decided to start with Portugal. Um, and at that point, I was like, hey, uh, I'm going to move to Portugal myself. I like it so much. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be my first, my first client. And, and yeah, that, that's how I, I got there. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to do it. Be your first client. Uh, and uh, just for a little bit more background, where, where in Spain are you from? Yeah, so uh, I'm from Coruña. It's called, it's uh, like a small city in the northwest of Spain. Uh, even though, you know, I was also living in Ma Madrid uh, for around three years uh, before moving to, to L.A. Uh, to study at USC. Yeah, Coruña uh, looks beautiful. Um, and uh, I guess for a little bit of added continuity, we always like to do this at the beginning of the episode, is, um, you know, a previous podcast guest who is Joey Langenbrunner. With Joey, we talked a lot about residency in El Salvador uh, we talked about the Portugal program as well. Very interesting uh, international guy. And I think you guys are sort of now starting to work together on base flow. And when I saw the idea for base flow, um, I immediately got it. I could tell that you probably took a lot of the inspiration from Rebase from Peter Lovell's idea. Would that be accurate? Yeah, actually, uh, it was around that time, uh, you know, when I saw the, the announcement of uh, the, the Spanish Digital Nomad Visa uh, that uh, Rebase got started with, with Portugal. Uh, you know, in the end, uh, I was like, uh, yeah, I mean, Portugal is, is better right now. I understand why, why they're starting with Portugal. Uh, because like I said, you know, Spain just announced it, but didn't have any infrastructure in place. Uh, whereas Portugal, you know, it was ready to go. Uh, so yeah, like, uh, you know, the initial purpose is, is really similar, uh, even though there are some some differences that we can get in uh, later if, if that's interesting. Sure. Um, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I think Rebase, uh, which is Peter Level's startup, is a very interesting model. Peter Level's obviously being the guy behind Nomad List. So I think most people are familiar with Nomad List. And he, Peter Level's, is all about async and basically having a calendar with no meetings, no phone calls. And so he applied that async mindset to residency. And he said, why do I need to talk to all these advisors? At the end of the day, I'm basically just, you know, uploading my birth certificate. You know what I mean? Like, why, why is there so many like high touch points to this? And so he thought about basically automating aspects of this process. And so Peter Level started with Portugal for a number of reasons, obviously, because it's attractive uh, from a tax perspective, but then also it just, I guess, was a, a relatively easy program to automate. And so he set up the website and got to a point where I, I think he was processing more than 10% of all Portugal NHR applications, <laughs> which is really, really impressive. And uh, I, I would really hope that that model of sort of um, automated async residency uh, inspires other people to do it with other countries around the world. And uh, I have uh, I have similar ideas of, of coding up something like that myself. But yeah, tell us about how maybe base flow and rebase are different. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, honestly, that um, that you mentioned about, you know, being fully async and, and all of that. Uh, I think I think it's one of the main differences uh, because you know uh, we fully eliminated uh, the human element in terms of you know what the user perceives. So when you sign up, for example, at Rebase, you need to pay for like an onboarding call uh, yep. that the lawyers are doing for free, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, right. And then if you try to continue with the process, then they sell the lead to the law firm, uh, you know, at, at zero profit. And that's something that, that you know, uh, that we really try to make different uh, because we want to align incentives better in the sense that, you know, we are not, not doing onboarding calls uh, because in the end, uh, you know, we think it's uh, first uh, unscalable because it doesn't allow you to, to achieve software learn margins first. And then it's also, you know, annoying for the lawyers because they have to explain the same thing every time, whereas you can right. have... You know, like Stripe Atlas for company incorporation, you just have, can have a really good and comprehensive documentation and the user can, you know, read it, can go over it and, and answer all of all of their questions uh, without needing to actually, you know, talk, talk to a person. Uh, of course, there are some cases that are, you know, more on the edge and, and they are not so standard 
and and you know so far uh we have only been working with like the super straightforward standard cases like like going back again to the strike battlers example if you have a company that deals with i don't know gangs or or uh I don't know, uh, drugs or stuff like that, you know, they are not going to allow you to incorporate with Stripe Atlas because they really want to, you know, have like the typical tech startup uh, going through their process because it's going to be the same process for all those tech startups. So we are taking that approach to residency and, you know, helping all these digital nomads, uh, remote workers and, and whatnot that in the end, you know, it's it's the same profile. Um, and so that's something that we changed. And, and so we what we decided to do is say, hey, uh, here you have uh, all this documentation. If you have any doubt, of course, you can reach out to the customer support. We, we think that's very important. Um, but, but, you know, we don't want to, by default, do onboarding calls. Um, and then something that we want to do is like to, again, same as Stripe Atlas, own the process in, in the sense that, of course, we are not a law firm. We are not going to do all the legal processes uh, because we are just a software company. But, you know, we provide you the support through all the, the whole process. And if you have, you know, any problems, you can reach out uh, to us. And in the end, you know, we, we are there through the whole process. It's not like uh, we sell the lead to a law firm uh, and then, you know, you have to talk with the lawyers. So, so you do it in-house, basically. We don't do it in-house because we are not a law firm. So, so you know, for example, the power of attorney that the client is going to sign is going to be mm -hmm. with, with a law firm. It's going to be with a lawyer. Uh, right. Because, you know, we can't do that because... But you basically, like, continue to manage the process. Whereas with Rebase, like you said, they ba it's basically like a referral program, I suppose yeah. you could say. It's, 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 it's not, like, fully a referral program because in the end, you know, they have the platform and the lawyers are, are um, I suppose, like, managing the process through, all the, through the platform. Uh, but what we try to do is, like internalize it as much as possible without of course getting in legal matters that we can't get into because we are not a law firm uh mm -hmm. but you know doing as much as we can also to put another example uh we have married partnerships with housing providers with phone providers with private mailbox providers so That's you cool. know you, you can have all these services because what we really want to do is like provide as much support as needed through the process of moving to a country uh, so it's, of course, the, the most obvious thing is the legal stuff, uh, you know, and for that, you need a lawyer and we're going to connect you with a lawyer. Uh, we can't do it in-house, but, but you know, uh, we want you to, to, to support you and to be like an easier channel of communication maybe between you and the lawyers so you don't have to be chasing them over email and stuff like that. Yeah, I think that's key. Um, I, I almost want to get into some of those details about... Uh, how that might work is is Portugal pretty good about um, virtual mailboxes and getting like an address that you can ship stuff to and tell me about yeah, that. that. That was that was something that that uh, was kind of hard to find because um, I think maybe it's not as common as for example in the US uh, where you have many providers, uh, but we we found one that has like multiple locations across Portugal, and you know uh, we got that. Uh, discount from them uh, for our users mm -hmm. so so yeah i i think that that's something really interesting especially for people that you know they arrive to the country uh they don't know yet where they are gonna be long term but they need a place to you know be sending their stuff and, and, and receiving their documents and letters and so so i i think that's something really really convenient and of course you know in the future the the, the long-term vision is to be able to integrate all these services, uh, you know, be able to, for Baseflow to allow you to to get uh, a private mailbox straight from, from Baseflow or, or open a bank account straight away for, for our users. Uh, right now, you, you know, you, we are, of course, outsourcing everything because, you know, these guys are going to do the private mailbox thing better than us because that's what they do or the, you know, housing marketplaces like Spot at Home, they're going to be better. Uh, but of course, at, at some point, you know, you can think of uh, virtually infinite ways to to vertically integrate uh, services because, you know, the, the, the mobility and relocation uh, industry, it's, it's really fragmented. Mm -hmm. and, and if you think about it, you know, it's first of all convenient to have all these services in one place. Uh, but then, you know, if, if one player can 
provide all these services, it's, it's even more convenient. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's definitely a good idea to bring in as much as you can because there's so many services that you need when you move to a new country. And so uh, walk us through the steps a little bit, specifically with Portugal. Maybe, maybe we'll get into the other ones, services that you have after, because I saw that you have Delaware LLCs, you have Spanish passports, uh, which I thought was interesting. But keeping the topic on Portugal, like what is the, what is the exact uh, process? How long would it take to get set up? Um, and then at what point can you open bank accounts and get an address and so forth? Yes. So uh, we are we are not doing a Spanish passport. We are launching uh, next week, uh, like some of these uh, CBI programs that, that Joey has worked with uh, before. Um, yeah, in Joey Langenbrunner. Yeah, he yeah, wants exactly. to do like and, Bitcoin and, and, passport stuff. Yeah, and he has been like really helpful in, in you know, making the connections and, and helping us uh, launch that as, as soon as possible. So so that's li like the next step after Portugal. And yeah, in, in terms of, you know, the Portuguese residency, uh, it's a variable timeline depending whether you are European, uh, like an EU citizen right. or, or not. Uh, because, you know, if you are an EU citizen, the process is, is really, really straightforward. It can be done in, in a matter of days. Um, you know, we just need some basic information from them, like, personal information and stuff like that. And after that, uh, you know, we are able to get the Portuguese tax ID number. And of course, like, like at any time of the process, the person can can actually go to Portugal because as European, you know, th there is no no limit on the entry. Um, so yeah, after uh, we get the NIF, uh, you know, we help them register at the at the city hall. So they get the, their certificate of residency. And then, uh, you know, get an account in the Portuguese tax authorities website, register as Portuguese tax resident, and then apply for NHR to get the special tax benefits. Um, you know, the lawyers are going to take care of that. Uh, we just help you manage it through through our platform. So it's more convenient for, for both parties. Um, and then, you know, we provide all these adjacent services like housing, getting a private mailbox, uh, a phone, and stuff like that. Um, and so if you are not European, uh, like from the EU, the process is, is a bit different uh, because, you know, mm -hmm. before actually going to Portugal, uh, you would need to to get a visa. Uh, what we're doing right now is, is like uh, working with people that are getting digital nomad visas. Um, so the process is, is not really that hard, uh, but, you know. You just good. You just uh, need to go to a Portuguese embassy or consulate. Make sure that you have uh, all the documents. Uh, you know, with some of them, we can really help you because, for example, getting the Portuguese tax ID or opening a, a Port Portuguese bank account that's something that we can help you with. But uh -huh. then there are others that are like really dependent on your country of origin. For example, you need to show a uh, proof of clean criminal record, and in the end, you know that's different in every country. So so. Uh, you know, that's something that you would have to kind of do um, on your own if you are, you know, from the U.S. requesting it to the FBI or, or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. If you are from Spain, uh, you know, requesting it on, on a different, uh, like to a different authority. Um, but then once you have the, the, the visa, you know, and you are able to visit the country, get your long-term residence permit, and then the process is, is pretty much the same. Uh, but like I said, you know, it's going to depend on the timeline from the Portuguese embassy that you apply at. So it might take, you know, as much as six months. Uh, but then the rest of the process, like registering as tax resident, it's pretty much, it's, it's pretty straightforward and it can be done in, in days. Mm -hmm. So yeah, obviously process is a little bit different for Canadians, Americans versus Europeans because they have freedom of movement in the EU. So let's say, you know, you get through the process, you officially become a resident of Portugal, you get approved. What's next? So I'm an approved guy. I'm in Portugal. The world is my oyster. What do I want to do next? I want to sign up for public health care. I want to maybe get a tax ID. I want to get a phone number, bank account, driver's license. What else? Uh, the, the the mailbox you said. Yeah, for example, also things like like you know getting the social security number and, and registering as freelancer if you need to to become a freelancer. Um, and also something really interesting that that you mentioned before is the uh, you know opening 
uh, or incorporating a company. And that's something that we currently don't do because Stripe Atlas does it so well, like allowing you to incorporate LLCs in Delaware from anywhere in the world. Uh, they do it so well that we are just, you know, <laughs> referring anybody that wants to incorporate a, a company in the US to, to use their service. Uh, gotcha. And also there are many other services like, I don't know, cap base or autonomous. There are many, many companies that, that are focusing on that. So that, that's not something that, that we are really trying to do. Uh, we want to focus more on uh, solutions for individuals, like in this case, Portuguese residency or, or what's next, next uh, that is, uh, you know, passports and, and like helping people get citizenship by investment or, or by donation. Okay. And just keep walking us through the game plan of like what we can get done once we become a resident. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we offer an annual subscription that is to cover just, you know, the ongoing legal representation costs. Um, we are also, you know, trying to connect you with, with uh, lawyers that can help you uh, with the tax filing. So that's also more convenient. Uh, you know, you know, actually the, the vision is to have everything that you would need uh, first, of course, uh, legally talking, uh, but then also like, you were mentioned in other aspects of life, like, you know, finding a, a place to live, uh, getting a, a phone, a Portuguese phone number, uh, getting a, an eSIM through IRALO. We also have a partnership with them. Uh, or even, you, you know, uh, th things like like uh, working in remote. We, we have just cl closed a partnership with Deal uh, to offer you a discount in case you, you either want to hire people through Deal or... or or to get hired through deal. Um, I think, you know, that, that's something really convenient and that's something that, that they are doing really well. Yeah, 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 very cool. Um, Maybe tell us a little bit more about Portugal from a lifestyle perspective, because you've lived in the US as well. Uh, you spent some time at USC. Uh, how would you uh, <laughs> compare uh, living in the US versus living in Portugal? Um, and I guess Portugal versus Spain as well. What do you? What are some of the the benefits or uh, nuances of Portugal versus Spain? Yeah, so I would say that that Spain is uh, like sorry, Portugal is uh, quite similar to Spain, especially the, the region I'm originally from in Spain, that is like the northwest Galicia. We also speak Galician. That up until which is the, very similar, right? Yeah, up until the 15th or, or 16th century, it was basically the same language. It was Galician Portuguese and then they diverged, you know, and now we have Galician and, and uh, there's also Portuguese in Portugal and Brazil. Um, but, but you know, uh, that's something really nice because uh, the language barrier is not so big for me. And in terms of the culture, it's also like really, really similar, the, the culture in Portugal to, to the court culture in, in Galicia, uh, even, you know, more than, than in some other regions of Spain compared to, to Galicia. Um, so yeah, that, that's something, you know, that I really liked. Oh, also the, the food is so, so nice. Uh, uh, you know, like in Spain, uh, but also the, the, like the gastronomy is more similar to the one in Galicia, like, like more seafood, um, and, and stuff like that, uh, which I really like. And, and also compare with the U S, uh, you know, it's a no brainer, uh, like, like the quality of the food. I mean, in the U S you can also get like really good, uh, food, uh, especially, you know, you know, where I was in LA, in California, uh, but you have to pay a lot for it and it's not really, uh, like, like accessible. So at that point, you, you know, you, you are kind of making a trade off, uh, whereas in Portugal, you know, you can have a really good meal for like 15 euros. Um, and you know, that, that's something I really value. I, I, I also worry a lot about, uh, health and stuff like that. So that, that's something really important. Um, and also, you know, uh, I'm writing a, a blog post on, on this, like, you know, when I made the decision, uh, to move from, from California, from, uh, LA to, to Portugal and something that I really, uh, took into consideration was, uh, the weather, uh, the weather is so, so nice, uh, especially, you know, in the South of Portugal, uh, like from Lisbon, uh, till, uh, the, the Southern parts of, of Portugal. It's super sunny. It's uh, warm year round, uh, and you know that, that's something that that uh, I find really nice too. Uh, I like surfing, so so that that's great. Um, 
and yeah, and and then you know, uh, comparing also like uh, the lifestyle and and uh, meeting people. I think Portugal is is especially Lisbon is way more international than, for example, Madrid, uh, where where I was, uh, where I really too. You think so? Yeah, yeah, like many many more people speak English in in Lisbon. Uh, you also see it's like like. Yeah, lots of expats, uh, foreigners. That then, in Madrid, I still feel that like you know, of course, it's a big European city. It's international, but but in Lisbon, you really feel that like you know, there are lots of uh, expats that are not only visiting, but they are living there. Um, and you know, that's something that you know, I personally like. Uh, maybe you know, uh, there are different opinions if you ask uh, a Portuguese that have that has been living. Uh, his or her entire life in Lisbon, and now they see you know lots of expats coming to to live there. Um, you know, in the end, I th I think that's something positive uh, because you know, in the end, these these expats have higher purchasing power, uh, and they are gonna s spend money in the country. They are gonna generate jobs, uh, but of course, you know, on the other side of the coin, uh, you have like the local Portuguese that uh, you know maybe work in primary uh, industries and they're like you know being pushed away of of the cities uh you know of course i understand it's not nice uh for them in in some ways uh but in the end you know i think uh immigration especially uh qualified immigration is always a net positive for a country you have the example of the us that that was you know built by immigrants basically if you think about it, there are some statistics, for example, in the US about uh, the Fortune uh, 500 companies that have been built either by first or second generation immigrants. And like, I don't know the exact number, but but I'm going to say it's roughly around 60, 70 percent uh, of, of the companies that have been built by first or second generation immigrants. And if you think about it, you know, you know, in the end, immigrants are more uh, risk uh, taking and and you know, I really, really think I'm really convinced that that one of the keys to to unlocking innovation in a country and unlocking economic progress, it's having like you know really pro immigration policies, and that's something that, for example, I don't like about the US right now, is that it makes they make it so difficult for people to move there, uh, especially you know even qualified people. Um, for example, in Europe, I would also say that we have a demographic problem and we need basically more people. That's it, point. We need more people. Uh, but, you know, especially if you don't need more people because, you know, you already have like a well-structured demographic population pyramid, it's still good for the country to to allow these, you know, immigrants to, to come and create jobs and, and bring change to, to the country. Uh, of course, there are going to be some like short term downsides, for example, with gentrification. I understand that uh, it might be not so nice for the locals, but I think it's in the short term. It's like, you know, if you think about uh, Ludits and, and going against technology, you know, of course, technology might destroy jobs in the short term. But I really think in the long, long term, it's a net positive for everybody. Uh you know, I'd rather be poor nowadays than be rich in the 1600s. Um, so, yeah, in, if you think in the long term, you know, I think technology is a no-brainer and immigration is a no-brainer. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, let's talk uh, more about the idea of freedom as a service and just sort of continue to double down on our previous conversation about making things frictionless and sort of the future of, of where things are headed. Um, and actually, before we, we get to that, let's talk a bit about Pioneer and about how with Baseflow, you actually went through a uh, accelerator program or an incubator program in Silicon Valley. So you, you uh, applied with Baseflow, with your idea, with your MVP to Pioneer, um, I guess got accepted, spent some time in the Valley. T tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so uh, Pioneer has been, you know, a great experience for me. Uh, they have like this uh, format where there's an open competition that you can just opt in 
start submitting weekly updates and then you know other founders will start upvoting or downvoting your your updates and then once you reach the top 50 global the team can select you as pioneer uh, and you know when they select you uh, they give you some funding and they put you through their startup acceleration program um, so I did it uh, when I was in LA, like the two month online acceleration program. Uh, and then I did the extra one month in SF, like in person program, working, you know, in an office with the team, with the pioneer team, and also, you know, living with other pioneers. And honestly, like it was great. Uh, we were able to have some mentors. Uh, yeah, I can, I can only say good things about it, especially you know, for, for uh, people that are just starting out with their projects, uh, because also like something that has been really nice for me is that, you know, the pioneer community is really global. The people that are participating mm -hmm. in the in the competition are from all over the world. Uh, so uh, that's how, for example, I got some of my first customers uh, through Pioneer just saying, hey, I'm building this. And, and you know, these people found it helpful. And, and you know, that has being great for me. Uh, that's also why up until this day, you know, I keep participating, maybe not every week or or, or, or being as consistent as I used to, but I try, I try to participate from time to time because, you know, it's always nice to, to bring more eyes uh, to what you're building, especially, you know, from people that are also builders and, and can have like a, like a critic eye uh, and, and, give you some constructive feedback and also might be, you know, interested in it. So, so uh, I think, like I said, it's great, uh, especially if you are just starting out uh, because it also allows you to have this sort of accountability yeah. before you even have a team or, or whatever. And what's interesting is that um, I guess like an immigration as a service company is not a typical Silicon Valley startup. And so it's a little bit, it was, there was probably a lot of, um, decisions or unique aspects to what you're doing where you had to sort of um, figure out how to um, set up what you're doing in a way that's um, that that works with Silicon Valley right because they're all about being able to scale things and being able to have a, a repeatable model and being able to you know invest equity into it in order to scale faster and so forth and so you had to ensure that what you're doing at baseflow, was a repeatable model because a lot of this immigration as a service stuff is very boutique. It's very bespoke and high touch, but we need to make it more commoditized, right? Yeah, exactly. And honestly, like that's, that's, you know, kind of the mission of Baseflow. It's just to have this tech product that allows you to move countries in a way that feels like, like the, 21st century, not, not the 20th century, uh, that, you know, of course, like, like if you have the economical resources to pay thousands of dollars to a law firm and have, like you said, this more boutique experience, that that's nice. Uh, but, you know, in the end, I believe mobility should be a fundamental human right. Uh, so making it as accessible as possible, uh, you know, I, I think it's it's something that, that uh, it's really worth working on. Um, and also what you were mentioning about, you know, the, the Silicon Valley way of, of doing things, uh, in the end, you know, I see it as beneficial because, you know, they are pushing, uh, the project or, or I am pushing the project in this direction. So, you know, being able to, to grow fast aligns well with what I want to do because I wanted to make it as accessible as possible to, to mm -hmm. more people. Uh, and then, you know, of course, being able to have a repeatable model, I see it as, as something good and being able to to drive down costs. That's also good because that's what what's going to allow me to drive down price also. So, yeah. So what can we do to drive down costs in this industry? Yeah. So first of all, you know, the obvious is to automate what can be automated, eliminate what can be out, what can be automated. Uh, and, you know, especially after you have a high volume of people, I think that's the point where you can start, you know, really optimizing processes. Uh, but of course, you're going to reach certain threshold where you can't, uh, you know, optimize further. And so I really think like 
the end game for something like this is to be able to integrate directly with government APIs. Uh, you know, so at yeah, some point, if someone want, yeah, if someone wants to become a, a Portuguese resident and we need to get a tax ID for them instead of, you know, having them to sign a power of attorney with a lawyer so the lawyer can go in person to a Portuguese authorities building and hand some documents in paper. You know, if instead of that, we can just directly link to the, to the, with, with the Portuguese government APIs and automatically submit everything. You know, that's the point where, where you can achieve uh, software level margins. Uh, you need two things. Either a government that is really like pro tech and and you know and and they really want to do this, and that's for example the case of Singapore that they have a bunch of companies that that you know can do e residencies and stuff like that, and then on the other hand you know you can also, I believe, push it in a in a way if you know you are bringing one thousand two thousand or or ten thousand people a year to the country, uh, maybe at some point the government realizes, hey, maybe we can make this easier. Uh, so actually, you know, we can 10x this number. Yeah, there's kind of two sides of it. It's like you can get better at preparing things uh, for the government application or the government can make things easier for the applicants. And so in an ideal world, the government will be, would be, you know, sort of making things easier for applicants and, you know, maybe making it easier to upload documents online and so forth. But in the absence of that, at very least, there's a lot of work that we can do on our side to help automate the process and prepare things better for the application. Yeah. And so I was thinking about it, like, obviously you can make sort of a, a software or whatever, where you can upload your documents, upload your birth certificate, police check, marriage certificate. And, and then you can either have that manually looked over by someone to ensure that there's no uh, inconsistencies that, you know, all the documents have been uploaded correctly, that we have everything we need, or like the next level would be uh, actually having like AI and machine learning being able being able to sort of read over these documents and check that all the dates match, check that you have all the documents you need, stuff like that. Have have, have you gone? Uh, ha, like, what are you guys doing in that direction? Yeah, of course. I mean, that that's something that that could be improved. Um, but you know, in the end, uh, the governments are still using people. So, uh, you know, of course, the idea in an ideal world. Uh, it, it would be like the government who was using these sort of systems to kind of review everything. Uh, but, you know, um, if you need someone from the government to be approving your visa or reviewing your documents, that, that's that's a bottleneck uh, in the end. So, you, you know, even if you as a company review everything, uh, even if it's correct, you know, uh, it's going to be delayed by the bottleneck that, that it's the government itself. right right yeah the government's i guess always going to be a, a bottleneck unless they really really make it a priority but yeah. there's still a lot that we can do on our side to sort of make things yeah. more efficient because like it's been many times where um i've been going through a process and only like i've given them all the documents they need but only weeks later or months later, they go, oh, actually, like <laughs> you need something else or this isn't matching, things like that. And they yeah. should have been on it way earlier. Yeah, 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 I agree. And so obviously you can have someone manually check that over, right? You have like your Portuguese lawyer, like you guys probably have, you know, a Portuguese law firm that you work with or whatever. You know, you, you, you hand over the documents to your Portuguese law firm. You say, hey, look this over. Make sure this is good to go before we submit it. But a next level would be to maybe have like a pre-screening and maybe have like some AI do it or at least some sort of like software yeah. element that can check over the documents first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that would be great. How, like, have you done anything like that or do, like how do you – how does it work? So someone maybe puts all their documents in a Dropbox file or something, and then you have your team uh, manually look it over? Or how, how yeah, does that sort of screening you, work? You know, yeah, like, like I said, uh, you know, in the end, uh, the law firm is doing all of these processes. So they want to manually review it. Uh, in the end, you know, if you want to work with them, 
it's better to not change a lot the way the way they they do things. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's a great idea to do in the future, like kind of a, a pre-screening. Uh, but like to be honest, nowadays uh, since it is not like really complex, what you need to move to Portugal, and people usually upload it well the first time. <laughs> um, you know, for the ones that don't, uh, it causes like, like a bit delay of, of some hours or, or some days even. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, la- like like I said, you know, it's not the main focus right now. Uh, but yeah, it's it's something that sounds really interesting to work on in the future. Yeah, definitely. So what if someone, you know, they pay the fee, thousand bucks, whatever it is, um, on, you know, they buy it on a credit card, they upload their documents. What if you kind of find out that they're not eligible for whatever reason, then you just like, they have they already paid at that point and you refund them or do you check the documents over before they pay? You know, if, if of course we are, still go over, you know, uh, it's client to see that, that, uh, they are eligible and, and before we approve the, the application, uh, if it is a case where, you know, uh, the client can't go through the process because, uh, it's their fault and we have already incurred in some costs. Uh, we're going to issue like, like a partial refund uh, that, you know, uh, it's going to be at our discretion because we have also, uh, you know, paid the lawyers and, and go, go through the process. But if it's something that, like, you know, that we see that's uh, really obvious uh, that, you know, that they won't be able to make it uh, before we even approve the application, we say, hey, uh, right. we think you are not So, so I guess there's it. two situations. One is... They just straight up are not eligible for whatever reason. And then yeah. the other situation is that they, they're just missing a document and they need to go get it from, I guess, yeah, their for home, yeah, from their home government. Document. And the yeah. issue is it can often take months. Like in Canada to get a police check or birth certificate now is take it used to take a couple of weeks. But I don't know, with COVID or whatever, it's taking months now. So it's really, really delaying things. And so you know, it's kind of a weird situation for you guys because I guess someone's already paid, but then you can't even start the service till like six months later when they get everything. How do, how do you deal with that? You know, we can start the process because, for example, before getting a visa, you need to get a Portuguese tax ID number. You need to open a bank account. So there are some things that, that you really, you, you not only can do before, you know, getting to Portugal, but you need to do because you need to have them before getting the visa um so you know there are there are of course some people that wait until they know they have everything before actually paying for the service and, and going through it and there are others that are like hey i'm just gonna pay now and and secure this so they can also you know help me gather everything help me make, make sure i have everything uh mm-hmm. before i even get my my visa um but yeah like, like i said you know uh, in the end that's uh, a personal decision uh Okay, cool. Because I feel like that's part of it. It's like everyone's like ready to go. They're like, yeah, let's get the residency, blah, blah, blah. And then it's like, no, you need a document and it's going to take you six months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's something we also want to be really upfront about uh, is, you know, all the documents that you need, especially if you are uh, from outside the EU. Uh, and, and be really clear that, that, you know, that you need to make sure that you're going to be able to get that uh, and that it might take longer. Uh, but like I said, for, for Europeans, it, it's, uh, really, really straightforward. And that's also why, you know, we chose to start with Portugal. Mm-hmm. And do you do like combination services for people as well? Like if they want to get the Portuguese residency and the U S LLC and maybe a, a Spanish digital nomad visa, stuff like that. Do you, do you put things together as a package? Yeah, not currently, because uh, like I said, the only thing we are working on right now, it's Portugal. We are starting to do like the CBI uh, passport programs uh, very soon. And as soon as we have that, probably we would, you know, uh, help users combine several solutions. Uh, mm-hmm. But so far, you know, it's it has been just Portugal. So, so not really. Okay. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, so what are some of the benefits of Portugal as a base? 
Yeah, so first of all, like I've said, uh, I think, you know, it's a great pla place to live. Uh, great weather. People are really friendly. The culture is great. Um, but also, you know, uh, in terms of taxes and more on the financial side, um, I think it's one of the best places uh, in Europe, um, especially, you know, if you are, well, not so much into crypto because that changed this year. It used to be 0%. Now it's just 0% if you hold it for more than one year. That, you know, I think it's great. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a long-term guy, so uh, I don't really care about that, uh, you know. Um, and then there's also like 0% tax on wealth, 0% tax on foreign income and dividends, 10% uh, tax on pension. So it's also great for pensioners, 20% tax on, on freelancing. Um, and also, you know, it allows you to to get a Portuguese passport in around five years, which mm -hmm. I also think it, it's great uh, if you are from outside the EU. Um, so, so yeah. Um, do you think you're going to do that? Are you going to become a dual Spanish Portuguese citizen? Yeah, if I, if I can, probably yes, uh, because you know, like I said, I think everyone should be given the choice of uh, getting you know as many passport citizenships and, and wherever as they like uh that, that's also why i'm a really big uh supporter of the network state uh because you know i really believe in people opting in the governance systems that they want to adhere to um so yeah that, that's something that i'm definitely interested in uh but yeah like i was saying you know all these tax benefits are really great but it's kind of a shame that it's only for for foreigners um i understand that you know the Portuguese government wants to incentivize uh, people going there. And, and of course, you know, this is doing it because because the program is great. Uh, but there is the same problem as in Spain, you know, as, as a Spanish in Portugal, I'm getting all these benefits. But if I was, uh, you know, a Portuguese in Portugal, I wouldn't get them or, or a Spanish in Spain, I wouldn't get them. But if I was a Portuguese in Spain, I would. So, so yeah. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. Um, I guess as an aside, uh, have you, since you're so familiar with this world of internationalization and, and uh, you know, plan B's and residencies and stuff, have you done any other programs yourself? Like, have you done any programs in Latin America or, I don't know, Dubai, anything like that? No, no, I haven't. Um, I Like I said, I moved uh, from Spain uh, to the U.S. and then back to the U.S., from the U.S. to, to Portugal. Um and the only thing that I have been doing uh, with regards to that matter is, uh, you know, joining network states uh, because uh, I really resonate with, with their ethos. Uh, at some point, uh, I think, you know, I will probably go through one of these CBI programs or, or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so far, <laughs> just the, the uh, Portuguese residency and, and some network states uh, from which I'm, I'm a citizen, but yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, when you guys do start the CBI program, um, what what country do you guys think you're going to start with first? Uh, it's likely going to be Antigua and Barbuda uh, because we have already talked with some registered agents there. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a great program, too. Um, we are also looking into San Lucia, Dominica, San Kitts and Neves. Uh, but I think Antigua and Barbuda is going to be the one we are, we are going to start with. Nice. And why, why would that be? Uh, first of all, you know, because we have already soft commitments from these uh, registered agents uh, to start working with them as soon as, as the platform is ready. Um, and also, like, of course, it's one of the most popular programs. Uh, we think it's great. And, and yeah. Very cool. Very cool. What do, what do you think are some of the other products that you would have uh, in the future like have you looked into latin america specifically yeah yeah actually uh you know i have a good friend of mine who is from mexico uh and and i see lots of digital nomads remote workers moving uh from the us to to mexico uh to live and work there uh so probably uh you know something mexico costa rica i know it's also really friendly to to remote to digital nomads in paraguay uh, too. Uh, I've heard about their uh, residency program. Lots of people are, are doing that right now, too. Uh, so that's uh, the ones that come to my mind as, as a first thought. Paraguay and Mexico? 
Yeah, in Costa Rica too, probably. Costa Rica, interesting. Yeah. Have you looked into Costa Rica? How would that work? Would people be doing the 60K bank deposit or, or a different way? Honestly, I haven't looked uh, much about it. Um, a good friend of mine, I'm aware that uh, he lived there for a while. Uh, he's like a digital nomad and, and he talked really well about it. Uh, but like I said, uh, I'm laser focused right now on, on Portugal and trying to launch this Antigua and Barbuda program as soon as possible. So I, I haven't really looked into it. Mm -hmm. uh, but like I said, I've heard that, that it's great. Uh, I would probably have to do a lot of research on it first. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I have an idea that I'm going to toss by you, um, which is, because uh, I was just thinking about the, the bank deposit thing. So there's obviously a lot of programs out there in the world where you can get residency if you make a real estate investment. But mm -hmm. At this point in time, it's not very fluid in most countries to actually make that real estate investment. You're going to have to go find it yourself. Um, you're going to have to be quite involved in the process. It's going to be annoying. But if you're a high net worth individual, right, and a $200,000 investment in an apartment uh, isn't really a big deal for you, uh, and you just want it done for you, right? We need more services like that, where it's just like, okay, I want to do Turkey, I want to do Malaysia, I want to do uh, Panama, whatever it is, right? But I don't want to actually have to look for the place. Um, maybe I don't even want to live there. Maybe I just want it like rented out or something for a you know a, a modest yield after after I make that investment. Let's set up basically a a, a firm or a program that. Um, we have the, we have the investment ready to go for you. We can basically guarantee that it's going to yield some percentage when all you got to do is basically, um, send the wire transfer over and we'll like get everything done for you. So basically like investment residency as a service. Yeah, that's, that's a great idea to be honest. Uh, like I said, you know, as soon as you start getting into this, you can think of many many adjacent services that that make sense uh that's one of them uh like i said i think it's a great idea uh, i would have to you know really get into the legal details because also that like uh many of these countries require that that the wire is made on your name and and that in some cases you know the the client or the or the beneficiary of the passport is making the wire directly um mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe acting as an intermediary uh, in that way. Like, maybe it couldn't be done directly in that way. But, yeah, I'm sure, like, you know, facilitating, like, looking for properties or at some point, you know, the same way I'm talking about finding a place to live in Portugal, I could be talking about, you know, finding a place to to buy in, in one of these countries, like you said. And, and yeah, basically, you know, having them aggregated into base flow and just click the one that you like. Uh, yeah. Cause obviously there's some programs where you can just show a bank balance. There's some programs where, uh, you show passive income. There's some programs where, uh, you invest in a, a CD a certificate of deposit. There's some programs where, you know, you got to buy real estate. So there's sort of different ways to get the residency, but at the end of the day, it can all be more or less automated or at least a lot more steps than currently are. And how great would it be if we can get to a point, an online checkout cart, and it's like Mexican residency, Paraguay residency, buy now, you know what I mean? Yeah. And just buy, like you could just get multiple at once. You don't have to talk to anyone. It's just a buy now button. And, yeah, exactly. Uh, and exactly. And, and also, I, I think, you know, that's something really important in, in making it mainstream because, you know, many people nowadays still don't consider that it's something that they need or that they want like to have a second passport and and you know if you can make it just not seem sketchy not seem like, like something from james bond or, or something that a spy would do just you know something that a normal person would do just to protect themselves from local politicians and uh you know a good analogy that that joey uh usually uses is that you know if you have two parents if one says, hey, you can't go out, but the other one says, yeah, go out, uh, then, you know, they're going to have to to discuss between them. Whereas, you know, we have seen with the pandemic, if one country says, no, you are locked in here 
in, in you are locked in. Uh, you don't have, you know, uh, a way out of, of that country, even if it's your home country or whatever. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just a way to, to protect yourself, to protect your life, your assets uh, from, from, you know, government decisions. And, you know, in, in the end, uh, something that, that I also really like to think about is the way that, for example, Bitcoin uh, created, like, monetary sovereignty in the sense that you can not only, you know, own your your own money, uh, but also with crypto, you can create uh, your, your own money. And, you know, I like to think about all this residency, passport, governance stuff, about, you know, allowing people to, to be truly sovereign in their governance decisions and really deciding uh, which governance providers they want to use, uh, which services they want to pay for and, and which, they, which ones they don't. So yeah, man, mm -hmm. uh, really excited to, to be working on this. Yeah, crypto is another rabbit hole. I don't even want to get into that. I did have a question about uh, Portugal, which is Madeira. Um, and I know that there's like special tax benefits for starting companies in Madeira, and it can even be uh, one of the most beneficial places to incorporate in all of Europe. And I was wondering if you've uh, looked into that and have considered offering uh, something around Madeira in, in the future. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am aware that they offer some some uh, benefits in the you know local um, spectrum, um, but but that's something that you know I'm not really looking to to do in the future. Right now, maybe you know, uh, of course, some things can change, or or I can just change my mind, or or you know, get some people requested. Uh, and and currently, you know, I'm more focused on being able to integrate something like Stripe Atlas, with, which I think it's a really good product. It's really straightforward to have mm -hmm. like just an LLC or even accompanying Estonia that is uh, still inside of the of the EU. Um, so, so that's not something I, I've been uh, really looking to. Um, also, like I said, you know, we are really focused on the on the individuals and, and you know, giving them tools. Uh, to be more free and not so much on, on companies and company incorporation because there are so many firms that are focused on that. You have, for example, Dylan Remote that allow you to to hire people uh, in remote. Uh, Deal just bought Capbase that allows you to incorporate companies. Then you have, of course, Stripe Atlas. You have Autonomous that allows you to incorporate companies anywhere in the world. Uh, so I think, you know, there are many players uh, in, in that industry. Uh, but, you know, in the industry of, focusing on individuals and helping them get residency. Of course, there are players because there are many law firms, uh, but there are not really like many tech enabled players. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was some of the, speaking of tech, like what was some of the advice you got when you were in Silicon Valley about this industry? I bet um, a lot of the mentors and so forth had, had some ideas around it. Yeah, so so uh, to be honest, like the biggest criticism that I have received is that the the market was not big enough for something like this uh, because you know always in Silicon Valley they 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 like to think big and they like to think global and make global products. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know whenever I talked about Portuguese residency, they were like, oh yeah, the market is not big enough. Uh, but I don't know, like, I think that people that really get it and that are really familiar with, like you said, internationalization and, and global mobility and stuff like that, uh, they really get it because it's obviously, you know, just you have to start with something, uh, in our case, Portuguese residency. But as soon as you have that, probably that the people that were interested in moving to Portugal, they would also be interested in, in getting a second passport or in moving eventually to other country once the tax benefits uh, mm -hmm. expire. Um, so, you know, I really think that, that the market for something like this is really big. Uh, the only thing is that, as I was explaining before, it's something that is currently not mainstream. Uh, you know, uh, it's an industry that, in my opinion, is still developing and you still have to, you know, create a category around it. Same as, you know, if you said to someone 10 years ago that you would have on a stranger's car, uh, it would be crazy. But now, you know, everybody uses Uber. Uh, so, you know, the same way I think nowadays, if you say, some, if you tell someone that you're getting a second passport, uh, you know, if they are normies, if, if uh, no, I get they, it. Yeah. So, so they, so, you know, the mentors were like, look, how are we going to make this a billion dollar company? And you said, oh, we can upsell other services like CBI and 
whatever virtual mailbox, whatever. Were they into that, or I, I bet that I bet they wanted to see more in in, in order to get this thing to a billion dollars. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like I think if I can really make it work uh, for a bunch of residencies, a bunch of passports, uh, and really ease immigration to those countries. I think, no, no, it's it's going to be a huge business. Also, like, if you just think about Portugal, around 64,000 people move to Portugal every year. Uh, so at $1,000 each, that's already $64 million in revenue. Uh, so, yeah, and, and for example, with passports, uh, there's much more money on it. So I, I don't really think, you know, it's, it's a question of, uh, is it going to be big? Uh, the real question is, is like, can you make it work uh, first, you know, uh, technologically, which which I think, yes, we can, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, but then also, like, like, can you actually get people to, to use you instead of uh, one of the legacy solutions, like, you know, a traditional law firm and stuff like that. And that's something that, that you know, uh, we are currently, that, that's currently our main focus. Uh, like I said, you know, we are kind of evangelizing the, the category uh, because people are, are just used to use uh, law firms and, and traditional services for something like this. So, you know, being a startup that is doing this, it's it's something new. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that the beginning, it's, it's always hard. <laughs> yeah, it definitely makes sense. So prove out the model first, yeah. get the, get the well-oiled machine running and then kind of figure out how to scale from yep. there. Um, by the way, like, how, did you guys like, other than Pioneer, have you taken on equity investment? Have you done a seed round? No, no, we haven't raised uh, any more money besides Pioneer. Uh, maybe in the future we do, uh, you know, uh, if we think that money is the bottleneck to be able to scale at that moment, uh, we are probably going to do it uh, because, you know, the company is structured to, to, to follow that route of, of busy funding and growing fast. And that's what I really want, you know, to, to grow fast and make it as accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Man, I have so many ideas around this and I think this is definitely uh, the direction to go. Who, uh, by the way, like who, who actually like coded things up? Like, is there a web app workflow? I can't, I can't immediately tell uh, just from the homepage. Yeah, yeah, me. Uh, I I code, uh, so it's not like really heavy on code. It's not like uh, something super complex. Uh, complex. I try to to keep things simple. Uh, but yeah, like, like uh, the web app, uh, it's integrated on 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 the main website. Uh, so you can you know log in, have your dashboard, make your yeah. application, and, and manage everything from from one place. Right, right. So the, the client actually gets to log in and have a dashboard and yeah. I guess maybe like see progress updates about how yeah. things are going. Yeah. That's pretty sick. What's it built on? Like what's the back end? Yeah. So uh, currently uh, it's mostly no code tools uh, with some code, custom code, uh, some, uh, you know, uh, I would say it's low code. Uh, it's, it's not fully uh, like proprietary technology. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you know, I also decided to do it that way because like I said, it's not super technologically complex. Uh, so the main thing, you know, it's in terms of process, uh, and, and be able to, to really nail the process, uh, and, and make people happy, both as, as users and, and, and service providers, like in this case, the lawyers. I, I see on the bottom of the page, it says building in San Francisco and Lisbon. And just makes me think about, would you say that at this point, Lisbon is the number one tech hub in Europe? I wouldn't say it's the main one, uh, the, the main tech hub itself. Uh, I think specifically for crypto, it is. Uh, I would say it's, it's one of the main crypto tech hubs globally. Um, and I think it's going to become also the, like the main general tech hub in maybe five to 10 years. Uh, but currently, you know, I think it's still behind. What what, do you, what what are like the top three or top five tech hubs in Europe? How would you rank them? I would say probably London, uh, Berlin, in no specific order. Uh, maybe Paris, um, Amsterdam. Yeah. Also Madrid and Barcelona, they are great. Uh, I think, you know, 
uh, the Barcelona ecosystem is is a little stronger than than the one in Madrid. Really? Uh, oh, then Madrid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you think, stronger, Barcelona or or Lisboa? Uh, I think for crypto, definitely uh, Lisboa. Um, in general, I would say right now they, they are pretty on the same, pretty much on the same level. I would say uh, mm. I haven't spent a lot of time in Barcelona, uh, so so I don't know. But from my perception, I would say they are uh, leveled. Yeah, very cool. Um, <laughs> another random question, but. Um, are you guys going to get into like tax services as well? Um, or are you guys like, I obviously I know you guys are focused on executing on residency stuff too. What are your thoughts on, on taking things in like a tax, tax advisor direction as well? Yeah, honestly, uh, that's something I'm not sure about because right now, like I said, you know, uh, the lawyers that are doing the Portuguese residency, some of them, they are also able to to help you with the tax filings and stuff like that. Um, I'm not really sure that's something we want to focus on, especially advisory. Like, like I don't think we should do advisory and we, we, we shouldn't do consultation uh, because, you know, in the end, we, we become a consultancy and that doesn't have software level margins. Uh, you know, definitely, it's it's a service that we want you to refer. We want to refer you to the best service providers. Mm -hmm. But right now, I don't think that's something that we would specialize on. Gotcha. And then, what about so people sign up with you? They get the residency in Portugal. They are going to have to file annual tax returns. Are they doing it through uh, your law firm, or 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 do you refer people, or how do you, how do they do that? Yeah, we, we refer people to lawyers that are able to, to do it. Uh, you know, in some cases, lawyers we work with. Uh, we, we Honestly, we haven't uh, had that many cases yet because we have only been working on this for, for one year. I started working on this one year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even one year since since the first uh, client got onboarded. Uh, so that's not something that, that you know, we have been working on a lot uh, but yeah like I said some of the lawyers we work with they are also able to provide that service uh, and, and we are you know still exploring if if it makes sense to include it in our subscription or just to say hey you have this separate service that that you can purchase and so you know they, they uh, deal directly with the lawyers because you know definitely that's something that we don't want to build out from scratch on our platform uh, so that's going to be outside of, of the base flow platform. Yeah, definitely makes sense. I, I'm not sure if you uh, released this information, but how many people have you uh, successfully helped with Portuguese residency at this point? Yeah, yeah. So I have a bunch of them. Uh, like I said, I was I was my, my first client. Uh, we have some people uh, from Colombia that are also like founders, uh, some remote workers from Nigeria, a uh, bunch of remote workers from Spain, and that's something that I'm really excited about, uh, like helping people uh, that are, you know, currently freelancers or remote workers in Spain uh, make the move to Portugal because I really think that that is uh, like really frictionless and, and, and the advantages are really good, especially in the first year. Um, so, yeah, that, that's those are like, like uh, the main nationalities we, we have uh, people from. Uh, also, uh, you know, Italy, uh, Germany, France, uh, the Netherlands. Yeah. I'm really excited about this model. Um, I think it's definitely the future. Are there any other topics that are sort of related to what we've been talking about that you think uh, I should have doubled down on or, or things that you'd be excited to talk about? No, I think, I think uh, we talked uh pretty much about, about everything. Uh, I think it was great. Awesome, man. Well, I guess at this point in time, tell everyone um, how they can find you, how they can um, sign up with Baseflow and yeah, just, just uh, promote what you got going on. Yeah, so uh, they can find it at Baseflow.io, um, also at Baseflow on Twitter. Uh, we are trying to be, to be active there. Um, so yeah, that, that's uh, pretty much it. Also, like uh, my personal 
website is uh, reco.us, reco.us, uh, and then on Twitter also at Alex Reco. So, so yeah, if, if they have like any doubts, if they have any questions before getting on board, they, they can, you know, personally reach out to me. Uh, I would be happy to, to help them and, and, and get them on board. Sweet. Alex Ricoso, baseflow.io is the website. Uh, Alex, I thought I thought a fun way to end the episode is I've never really heard the Galician dialect or language before. And I thought maybe you could say something like, uh, uh, this has been another episode of the My Latin Life podcast in Galician and, and send us out that way. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll try to do it. Uh, it's pretty similar to Portuguese, so it's probably going to sound Portuguese at this point. Uh, but yeah, uh, let's go. Um, este foi outro episodio de My Latin Life Podcast. Este foi. Este, este foi. foi. Este outro. foi outro episodio. Yeah. <laughs> Love it, bro. Well, dude, Alex, thank you for joining us. Super appreciated it. By the way, I should get you in touch with uh, our buddy, uh, Jamie uh, Ram Ramos, um, who's a Mexican guy of Galician ancestry. I think you guys would get along as well. He's yeah, I met, him. I met him in, in Lisbon too. Oh, really? Did you? Yeah, when well, he was in Lisbon. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we, we actually, uh, Jamie and I partied uh, when I was in Lisbon, we went out literally like the night of his flight. He was flying down to Paraguay. <laughs> he had, he had like a 5 a.m. flight, and so I brought him to the club, and uh, you know we partied until whatever 3 a.m. or something, and then he just you know Ubered back to his uh, hotel, packed up, and then headed straight to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Cool, man. Well, Alex, dude, thank you so much for joining us. This is a fun episode, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll continue to support each other in the future. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs>